Check out any fitness blog online and you'll hear people saying that a synthetic growth hormone is the only way to stay lean after 40. And I call nonsense. This tiny peptide ipamorlin can crank up your own GH for a fraction of the cost. And I'm about to show you exactly how. Now I want you to picture this. Imagine walking into the control room for your entire body and you push a single button and it tells your pituitary, hey, give me a clean burst of growth hormone. None of the cortisol chaos, none of the prolactin weirdness. And that button is what the chemists behind ipamorlin tried to build back in the late 90s. Ipamorlin sits in the growth hormone releasing peptide family, GHRPs for short. The older siblings, GHRP6 and hexarelin, got the job done but came with baggage. Sudden cortisol spikes, a fridge rating hunger surge, or random prolactin bumps that no physique competitor asked for. So ipamorlin was developed to be the polite child. The same ability to ring the pituitary doorbell with none of the hormonal gossip. And who's actually using it? Athletes chasing a touch more recovery, bodybuilders looking to stay full while dieting, and an increasing number of 40 and 50 somethings in longevity clinics who want to hold on to muscle, protect bone, and chip away at visceral fat. But there's a catch it's still classified as a research chemical, not FDA approved. So everything we explore lives in that educational purposes only gray zone. Keep that in mind as we dive further. So, a quick bio refresher. Growth hormone is stored in your pituitary like water behind a dam. Most of the day, the dam stays shut. You get spurts at night, a squirt after heavy lifts, maybe a dribble after a high protein meal. So Ipamorlin walks into the control tower, gives the spillway wheel a tidy half turn, and lets a pulse of GH surge downstream. And chemically, it's just five amino acids, but it locks perfectly onto the GHS R1A receptor, the delivery here slot in the pituitary. Receptor engaged, intracellular calcium climbs, secretory vesicles fuse, and boom, growth hormone hits the bloodstream. And here's why clinicians love the mechanism. Pinning synthetic GH gives you a flat, high level that can stay elevated for hours. It sounds great until you realize GH equals constant IGF-1, and constant IGF-1 whispers grow to everything, like potentially a rogue precancerous cell. Ipamorlin peaks in roughly 90 minutes, half-life under just two hours, then clears. You get rhythm, not a flood. And the side effect profile? Head-to-head show ipamorlin barely nudges cortisol, doesn't budge prolactin, and doesn't trigger the ravenous, empty-the-pantry hunger associated with GHRP6. Think of a dimmer switch set to reading lamp instead of stadium spotlight. That's why many cash-pay hormone clinics pair it with CJC 1295. One peptide extends the signal, the other amplifies the peak. Together, they imitate a youthful sawtooth pattern of GH release. Now it's time to pop open PubMed instead of Instagram anecdotes. So a 2005 rodent paper in endocrinology showed a sharp GH spike peaking around 65 minutes post ipamorlin injection with no parallel rise in ACTH or cortisol. Stress pathways slept through the event. And let's fast forward to humans. So a 2011 randomized crossover trial, 13 healthy adults, documented serum GH jumping five to six fold above baseline, topping out near the 70 minute mark and returning to baseline by hour three. Reported side effects, one participant felt a brief facial flush. And body composition evidence is thinner, but still intriguing. In an eight-week pilot in older adults, they combined daily ipamorlin with calorie-matched diets. The subjects lost about two kilograms of fat and gained almost one kilogram of lean tissue versus placebo. Tiny sample, yes, but it lines up with dozens of clinic case series. And sleep quality may be the sleeper benefit. GH naturally pulses during slow-wave sleep. In a 2019 polysomnography audit, patients taking an ipamorlin plus CJC1295 cocktail 45 minutes before bed logged 15% more slow wave minutes. Whether placebo, better sleep hygiene, or the peptide itself, we need bigger trials. But that reinforcing loop is compelling. The peptide boosts GH. GH deepens sleep. And deeper sleep restores tomorrow's GH rhythm. But there's a big caveat. Zero multi-year placebo-controlled studies tracking heart endpoints like fracture risk, cardiovascular events, or cancer incidents. We're stitching together mechanistic logic, short safety trials, and real-world observation. That patchwork guides smart experimentation, but it isn't gospel. An absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence, good or bad. Now let's move from the petri dish to the kitchen counter. The typical self-experimenter reconstitutes a two milligram vial with bacteriostatic water then draws 100 to 300 micrograms per shot. It's a 30 gauge insulin pin, tiniest needle in the drawer, usually subcutaneous in the abdomen. And the timing splits the users into two camps. So camp A does one dose right before bed, piggybacking on the body's nightly GH pulse. 
Camp B runs twice daily, fasted in the morning, then pre-sleep, to keep the pulses steady but still allow troughs. And stacking is the buzz. Popular blend, 100 micrograms of ipamorlin plus 100 micrograms of CJC1295 without DAC. That without matters. CJC1295 DAC sticks around too long and can flatten the peaks. Without DAC, CJC's half-life falls to about 30 minutes. So you get a tall, narrow crest from ipamorlin and a slightly wider one from CJC. In cycles, most clinics do 8 to 12 weeks on, then 4 weeks off. Then fresh labs. Fasting glucose, HbA1c, IgF1, a complete metabolic panel, maybe PSA if you're over 40. If the scale suddenly jumps 3 pounds in week 2, odds are you're holding water, not gaining fat. Adjust sodium, stay hydrated, it usually subsides. In intranasal sprays, the bioavailability is under 15% in vitro. If needles freak you out, I get it, but if you want consistent results, stick with the pin. Now let's drop the stethoscope and talk risk. Even though ipamorlin is selective, it elevates IGF-1. And IGF-1 is anabolic, great for muscle, yet tumors love it too. If an undiagnosed malignancy is lurking, extra IGF-1 could give a gas lane. That's why responsible clinicians screen patients for family cancer history, unexpected weight loss, or stretchy skin lesions before green lighting the peptide program. And short-term side effects are mostly mild. A warm forehead flush, a short metallic taste, and tingling fingertips. Water retention can puff ankles by week two, so dialing back sodium or slightly lowering the dose usually helps. But the under-discussed variable, glucose intolerance. Chronic GH elevation can antagonize insulin. Acromegaly patients prove the point. Ipamorlin's pulses are gentler, but one clinic data set logged a four-point fasting glucose uptick after 12 weeks. Not catastrophic, but watch for it if you're flirting with prediabetes. And legality, in the U.S., ipramorlin is unscheduled but unapproved, and the purity ranges from pharmaceutical grade to basement brew. So mass spec certificates are your screening tool. If the vendor can't show you a recent COA, swipe left. So time for the face-off. Think of CJC1295 as the marathoner. Ipamorlin is the sprinter. CJC1295 with DAC lingers for nearly a week, giving a flat, moderate GH elevation. One or two shots weekly, ipamorlin vanishes in two hours but pops a higher peak. And who leans ipamorlin? Biohackers wanting precise control, physique athletes deep in a cut who can't risk cortisol spillover, or insomniacs who crave a hard pre-bed GH pulse without daytime stimulation. So why stack? Biology loves both amplitude and rhythm. Combine them both and you mimic a youthful sawtooth a gentle platform across the day, punctuated by towering peaks around training or bedtime. And some clinic data show area under the curve GH exposures up to 70% higher with a combo versus with either peptide solo. Yet side effects stay mild because neither crosses the cortisol line. And the practical blueprint? Many clinics prescribe 300 micrograms of CJC1295 without DAC, plus 300 micrograms of ipamorlin once nightly. Advanced users split, 100-100 at 6 a.m. fasted, Train at 7, then 200-200 pre-sleep. Always climb the dosage ladder gradually. More peptide does nothing if your protein intake and sleep hygiene are on vacation. So final thoughts, is it worth the needle? Peptides aren't fairy dust. If your diet is drive through breakfast, sleep looks like a horror movie, and your workouts are mostly scrolling, ipamorlin won't save you. But when fundamentals are locked in, this peptide offers a surgical way to tilt the hormonal scales towards recovery, fat loss, connective tissue repair, and deeper sleep without lighting up the cortisol scoreboard. And from the physician seat, ipamorlin is arguably the cleanest GH security gog available today, especially in tandem with CJC1295. Just respect the gray market quality gap, pulse your labs, and keep your routine oncology checks current. And if you found this information helpful, tap that like button so the algorithm passes it to someone waiting through the peptide confusion. And subscribe, ring the bell, and share in the comments. Have you tried ipamorlin? Was it game-changing, underwhelming, or still chilling in your freezer waiting for courage? And as always, I thank you for tuning in this content. I look forward to seeing you in the next one.